is like this. The idea is at some point you look at a combination of a couple different things. First of all, your content, your message, what it is you're trying to say, and your user goals. And at some point, you decide it's not worth it to try to make a one-size-fits-all and to take a basic site and to kind of stretch it out maybe for a desktop or take a desktop site and try to shrink it down for a mobile. And you just decide, hey, I'm better off just making two different sites. Now, a couple things to realize is that this is just another tool in your tool belt. All right? This doesn't make those other things disappear, right? For some sites, the answer might be a mobile-first design purely with responsive web design, and that'll take care of your problems. You don't need to go to a separate one, depending on the nature of the content, all right? Um, however, typically with larger sites, you may look and see, well, maybe a mobile only is. Now, in addition, you'll notice we're going to go over an example today, and we're going to see that... Um, you know, we're still using some of the other techniques. We're still using responsive techniques and that sort of thing in our page. So again, it's not like these go out the window. It's that um, we, we pick and choose. And really your challenge as a designer, um, your challenge as a technician is to know all these different tools. Your challenge as a designer is to know when each one's appropriate for, for the given use. So how do we do a mobile site? Someone goes and visits our site, how do we know what site to send them to, and, and how do we handle that? We do that via server-side scripting, typically. All right. So now if you think about it, we have CSS and media queries, and JavaScript, and now we have server-side script, a whole set of tools that we can use and apply um, as needed to, to a given problem. So server-side scripting involves a web page not being a completed web page ready for delivery, but instead a set of instructions to generate a web page. So we're going to be using PHP in this class, but there's other server-side technologies as well. There is ASP.NET and so on. That's, that's one of the other very big ones. And the difference is, is with static, plain old HTML pages, when someone requests a page, request makes it to the server, the server simply delivers the files and everything that's needed. So it delivers to the client a package that consists of HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. Now, if you think about it, for more advanced sort of web applications, this approach couldn't possibly work, right? For example, let's talk about eBay, you know. Can you imagine eBay having, you know, a room full of 10,000 programmers, and every time someone new bid is placed, someone says, ooh, ooh, someone just bid on that Mickey Mantle baseball card. You better go and edit the HTML file to put the new price in, you know. It's absurd. That wouldn't, wouldn't possibly work that way. Or Google, someone saying, whoa, this time person's searching for CSS3. Let's, gen let, let's type out real quick an HTML page that has the CSS3 results. It doesn't make sense. It's absurd to even talk about it. So what are server-side scripts then? Server-side scripts think of them as being instructions for web pages. And since we're talking about PHP, I'll talk about it in terms of being PHP code. HTML simply, the server simply looks it up and delivers it. PHP, the server processes the page, processes the instructions, and generates an HTML, JavaScript, and CSS page. It's an important thing to remember. Whether you're talking about static HTML pages or pages created via PHP, what gets delivered to the client is the same sort of thing. JavaScript, HTML, CSS. The one analogy that sometimes I use is 
It's like the difference between ordering a sandwich from Subway and ordering a sandwich from McDonald's. You order a sandwich from McDonald's, you order a Big Mac, what do they do? They just turn around in the bin and give you that Big Mac. It's been pre-made and sitting there waiting for you. The server doesn't do anything really. Whereas in Subway, the server has a tougher job. Because you go in and you say you want a sandwich, but then you have to say what kind of bread you want. And then you have to say, do you want a toasted? And what kind of cheese you want? What kind of vegetables? And what kind of uh, dressing? And so on and so forth. All right? So in, in the case of PHP, think of PHP as being the recipe, the instructions to create a web page, as opposed to a completed web page. So what the web server does is it takes this PHP code, processes it, and creates an HTML document that gets sent to the server. And then, when we do this, all kinds of great things can happen, right? Um, we can interact with the user input, right? So if I say that I want to do a search on PHP, those instructions can look at what I typed in that form in Google and determine, gee, what, what do they want? And, and can use that input on the form, just like the subway person uses the input from the user about what kind of bread they want, what kind of vegetables they want, uses the input that are on forms to create that page custom on the fly. All right? Think about logging into Angel is another example. All right. When you log in Angel, you supply your user ID and password. All right. User input. The server then somehow processes that and creates a page just for you. So if any one of you were to look at each other's pages, it look different because you know you're taking you know these classes. Someone else is taking another class. Me as an instructor, not only am I have a different schedule than you, I serve a different role. I'm the instructor in the class as opposed to a student. So my page is going to look different still. All right? The idea is, is when, you, when, when these pages um, are written as server-side scripts and they're written in, in a full-blown programming language, you know, the sky's the limit, you know, um, as to what you can do. You can interact with a database. You can interact with other stuff on the web. We'll call this web services and so on. And we can bring all this together according to a recipe that we've defined and we can output to the client our package of HTML. All right? If you look at Amazon, for example, all Amazon pages look about the same. Why? Because they're all made from the same recipe. All right? What's different about it? Well, the particular item from the database that they want to see and so on and so forth, these other things come into play then to create that page custom on the fly for that particular product as opposed to another product. All right? Any questions about this in concept? Now, Here's where we're going to start working it to our advantage because now we have the power of a full-blown programming language at our disposal where we can do lots of cool things. Now, this is not a PHP class, to be sure. We are going to go into more PHP than they discuss in the book. In the book, they say, well, you know, we'll show you a few scripts and eh, you don't worry about that. Well, we're going to worry about a little bit uh, of stuff in PHP. Um, but... Uh, again, um, th this is not uh, a PHP class. You won't learn PHP up, down, and sideways uh, in this class. All right. One thing to keep in mind is that the client, the, the formal word for this, the client asking for a web page and supplying user input, is a request. And what the server sends back is called a response. All right. Now, what's associated with the request? Well, the web page that you're asking for. That's part of the request. Any user form information. 
So anything that you've put into a form is part of the request. In addition, there's a whole bunch of parameters about you and the, you know, you, the client, that get sent over there. All right? One of them parameters is what's called the user agent. All right? The user agent is effectively, you know, what browser you're browsing on. And then that can be used as part of this recipe to change the response. So if I ask for page A, which is maybe the full-blown website's version of the home page, this recipe can look at the user agent. Sometimes they call it user agent sniffing to sniff out, find out where it's coming from, and then respond, not by sending them to the page that they asked for, but sending them to a mobile version of the page. Again, when you add this PHP, you have the power of a full-blown programming language that you can do really anything you want. That's similar to if you request a page that doesn't exist. Let's say I go to lorraineccc.edu, xyz, 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 .html. Well, that doesn't exist. So what does the user do, or what does the server do, rather? It directs my response to an error page, a 404 error page. So again, keep in mind that in the most simple cases, the response is simply to give the person the page that they asked for. All right? But in more involved cases, the server can change that response to be something maybe a little different than they asked for. For example, send them to the mobile version of the site instead of the regular full version of the site. Now, what does PHP code look like? All right. PHP code, we're going to look at examples of this, but I do want to introduce these concepts to you before um, before we go forward. PHP looks like this. It looks like regular HTML. I'm so grateful for the HTML5 doc type that I don't have to try to cut and paste that long thing. I actually have this one memorized already, which is amazing. Yeah, usually I used to just carry like a template for everything right. with HTML. And I right. Right. I somehow think that every single program I've ever written was somehow copied from the very first program I wrote and just, you know, <coughs> names changed to protect the innocent, as they say. Anyhow, a PHP page is nothing more than an HTML document, plain HTML document, that has inserted as needed blocks of PHP code. And the blocks of PHP code are designated from the HTML by this directive. All right. You have a lesson sign question mark PHP, then you can have a whole bunch of PHP statements, then you have question mark greater than sign. This tells the server you're not in HTML land anymore. All right? This is not HTML code. This is PHP code. This never makes it to the client. Okay? Client doesn't know PHP. Your web browser doesn't understand PHP. Your web browser understands HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. This code, when the web server is parsing your script, all right? Parsing means it's going through it line by line. Anything that's plain old HTML simply gets sent to the client as is. So if you could imagine this being a web page on our server, this being a PHP script on our server, if I requested this page, anything that's plain HTML, that is anything outside of these directives, will get sent to the client directly. No translation. Just get sent, one after the other. Which means 
means that everything you've learned about HTML applies here too, right? HTML, CSS, JavaScript, all that applies. The difference is, is you're using code to write portions of your page. All right? When the server encounters something within these directives, the PHP directives, the server then goes into translate mode, where the server executes the code that goes in here in the, in the PHP language, and maybe outputs some results. And typically, results are outputted either through an echo command or a print command. So you might have a bunch of instructions that execute. The ones that are either echo or print are actually the things that are sending stuff to the client. So there may be a calculation involved. You know, maybe. I take a couple numbers that were entered in on a form and, and add them together. Well, there could be a whole bunch of lines of code that does whatever calculations are needed. What gets sent to the client, though, is through the echo and through the print. So that's all a PHP code is. Where can you put this PHP block? You can put it anywhere you need to. All right? You can put it anywhere you need to. All right? You can actually put it, you know, before the doc type and before the HTML, as we'll see an example of that. You could put it inside the head section. Back in the old days, we used to do browser sniffing in here to determine which style sheet to apply, Netscape or, or IE. That kind of practice has kind of gone by the wayside. Or you can put it in the body. You can even put a PHP directive like in the middle of an HTML tag. All right. Um, is amazing the flexibility, but again, uh, if you're not careful, you can produce some really hard to read code. All right, so I'm not sure what kind of web server is running on this machine, but I do have a web server for this class. I was not able to, I had a mini emergency this morning, so I was not able to create accounts for you, but I hope to have them created by Wednesday. All right. So I want to look up, uh, I want to go over an example that, that I've done and we'll look at the code. Uh, we might run it on a web server here provided that that web server is installed. I wasn't able to check that out. But we can definitely run it on the web server um, that, that we'll be using in this class um, and, and that you'll have accounts for uh, later. So let's go and do that. So let me pull out the mobile device here. we can do what we did last time, unfortunately. All right. I have a page out there. I'm going to open up my browser. Let me try. What, what's it doing? So, I'm going to 
to go to cisssql.lorainccc.edu slash ciss268 slash index.php. going to that address and I hit return and it here either because it looks like the server's down. Here's a page. This is a full site. Here's some code that indicates what browser we're running. This is meant to be a placeholder for content common to both pages. And finally, this is content that's only available on the full version of the site. So we'll look at this code in a minute here. Here we have on my mobile device the mobile version of the site. And you want to pass it around. It says mobile site. It says content common to both. And it says uh, link to full. Okay. Both of these pages I got going to the same URL. I got both of these pages going to, to CISSQL, blah, 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 index.php. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at that index.php and see how it did some things. All right. First of all, notice that um, notice that um, the content there's some content that's shared. All right. One of the things that we want to do when we make two sites, when we make two sites, we know we're going to have some extra work, right? Because there's more to do two sites than it is just to do one. But ideally, we want to make sure the site to as great a degree as possible are consistent. And we want to limit our maintenance. So we want to try to take advantage of using um, shared code, all right, to as great a degree as possible. And PHP will allow us to do that, all right? That's one reason I want to go a little deeper in PHP than they do in the book. I think without touching on that part of it, we can really, you know, we can really uh, lose sight of the power of, of this. All right, so I'm going to go and download this code from Angel, and then we'll take a look at it, and we'll do, I don't expect to get through this entire example, but we'll get through at least the main parts of it. I'm not sure why my background image is not showing. I do have, I'm supposed to have a background image on the full. So I'm not sure why that is. Let's see, is it a browser thing? No? Maybe I forgot to upload one of the files. All right.
Here's the folder. And notice that, I'm going to turn file extensions on. We have files of different types. We have a couple images, a JPEG and a background image. I'm not sure why the background image um, is having trouble. I must have messed something up. We then have an index.php. We have a mobile.php. We have a base uh, style sheet. We have a full version of the style, style sheet. Then we have a couple of INC files. INC is an abbreviation for include files. Include files are files where we can put chunks of code that we want duplicated between pages. So, for example, if we have a banner on our website that has, you know, the, the organization's name and their logo and maybe a little tagline about it, and that's going to appear on every one of our pages or nearly every one of our pages, we can put that code in an include file. And the nice thing is, is then we sort of get the maintainability and reusability like we do with CSS. So if our logo changes, we don't have to go into every one of our web pages and change the logo. We just go into the include file. All right. Now, a couple things. You have been used to, if you've been doing just plain old HTML files, doing something like this. Well, let me go and drag my PHP file into my browser or double click on the file or whatever. Oh, doesn't do any good, right? Why not? Well, as I said before, browsers don't understand PHP. Browsers understand HTML. So effectively, we've given the browser not a web page, which is what browsers want. Browsers want web pages that can consist of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. But we've given the web page a recipe. Oh, I'm sorry, we've given the browser a recipe for a web page. All right, instructions to create a web page in PHP. It doesn't know what to do with that. Therefore, it simply shows it as plain old text. So, in order for this to work, we need to run this through a web server. Just like in order to bring a recipe to life and make some food that we can eat, all right, someone has to go and process that recipe. Go and execute that recipe. Well, in this case, the web server has to execute that PHP script to produce the HTML. And simply opening the page in the browser doesn't cause the server to execute it. So, let me look to see what we have available here. We might have installed in here a web server. Let me check. We do. Let's see if it's working. It is not. It's giving me an error. Okay? So, um, you have to take my word for it. We'll, again, we'll have to hopefully have this knocked on 